Well, welcome everyone to CG seminar and webinar number 267. And today we have a, a webinar with the impressive title of Cosmopolitan Agency and Meaningful Intercultural Interactions Between International and Domestic Students and Ecological Conceptualization. Our speaker is Kazuhiro Kudo, Hiro, as his colleagues call him. Uh, I, I should declare, uh, I, I don't know whether the word right word is interest, but a long-standing association with Hiro, uh, which goes back almost 20 years. Uh, and, um, and I'm aware that he's, um, of his recent doctoral thesis, which he's going to, I think, speak to today, which is a very good and important piece of original research on the relationship between international and domestic students. Before I introduce him fully, let me just take you through the web webinar protocols. Um, now, remember that uh, the webinar is being recorded as it usually is and will be posted online on the CG website in due course. It finds its way to YouTube usually within the first 48 hours and uh, we're finding that people are watching our webinars on YouTube even more than they're watching them live. Um, now, during the webinar, keep yourself muted because picking up extraneous noise from your environment can, can be quite disruptive uh, for the webinar as a whole. And also, um, you know, keep, you don't have to have your camera on, you know, during the webinar itself, but um, we would like you to turn on your um, audio and your, your video uh, when you come into the Q&A part of the webinar and ask a question. We recommend using speaker view uh, so you can more clearly see who is talking. That's in the top right-hand corner of the screen, as you can see. Now, to ask a question, to come into the Q&A, whether it's with a question or a statement, um, indicate first in the chat that you want to do that and show us what your question or your statement might be. And on the basis of what's coming into the chat, I will then select participants into the Q&A. So it's a fairly open process, uh, providing your comment in the chat is relevant to the business of the of the webinar then we'll be able to bring you in the only thing is if you come in late in the webinar we might be have run out of time by that stage so it's a good idea to bring your comment forward sort of in the first ideally just before the speaker finishes actually and then in the first 10 minutes or so and then you're fairly certain to be able to take part in the discussion and when you're invited to ask a question of course you unmute yourself switch on your video and then state your name and, and where you are from. I'll give you a warning in the chat, um, usually if I can get to that, um, just so you'll know that I'm about to bring you into the discussion. Well, uh, let me turn now to Kazuhiro Kudo. He's an associate professor in the Faculty of Foreign Languages at Dokyo University in Japan, a board member of the Intercultural Education Society of Japan. His most recent research interests centered around the intersection of intercultural interactions, cosmopolitanism, conviviality, and agency in higher education context. But I think you'll get the best idea of what he works on by listening to him now. Let me hand over to you now, Hiro. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Simon, uh, for a kind introduction. I'm going to share with you uh, my slide. Um, so I hope... Um... Yes, we can see that. Oops, okay. Okay, so uh, dear lovely audience, or convivial, uh, fantastic colleagues and my friends, uh, thank you for uh, joining my sem uh, session uh, today. And uh, I'm quite happy uh, to talk about uh, my current most recent uh, work on, on cosmopolitan agency. So which is actually uh, an extension uh, of my doctoral work. Uh, so uh, the, my doctoral work was about how meaningful uh, intercultural relationships between international and domestic students uh, develops and, uh, you know, are forged uh, by those people uh, using the ecological uh, framework in a broad sense. And uh, today uh, is a sort of uh, extension uh, and, and, and focusing on uh, cosmopolitan agency. So let me uh, share with you a little bit uh, background of my work. And, uh, and as you can see uh, on the first line, uh, it's a very disturbing fact. I mean, even prior to the COVID, and uh, there were actually lots of lots of uh, challenges uh, for uh, students uh, to mix together. 
particularly uh, domestic and international students sort of division uh, was quite uh, obvious and salient in many parts of the world. So what I did my uh, doctoral thesis was uh, to uh, conceptualize how uh, these two student groups uh, meet, uh, get to know each other and develop and consolidate uh, their relationships uh, to each other. But today I'm not going to talk about much about friendship. Of course, friendship is a very, very important part uh, for international students and also for some uh, domestic students. Um, so what I'd like to focus on today is uh, cosmopolitan agency, uh, which I uh, identify as a significant hallmark of meaningful intercultural uh, relationships, uh, such as friendship and romantic relationships. And also uh, other uh, researchers, although it's, there are only few, but the other researchers use the word critical uh, cosmopolitan agency, uh, which uh, literally, uh, literally uh, refers to a kind of disposition or ability to act in difference uh, with a very critical and moral spin. Uh, but my talk today uh, is actually uh, derived from uh, uh, this idea that, that the literature actually, uh, as far as I know, uh, has not established uh, conditions necessary for the emergence of uh, this particular uh, agency. So today's uh, presentation uh, is about uh, to propose an ecological conceptual framework of cosmopolitan agency that emerges in interaction between international and domestic uh, students. And there are four parts. Uh, first, I define cosmopolitan agency. And second, I uh, put forward uh, an, an ecological conceptual framework of cosmopolitan agency. And third, I will illustrate uh, further uh, this uh, conceptual framework uh, by introducing uh, you to four states of cosmopolitan agency. And finally, I'd like to discuss directions for future research. So uh, today I have a lot of, I'm going to present you a lot, lot of ideas. So hopefully I'd like to uh, hear a lot of, lot of feedback, constructive and critical feedback from uh, you so that my uh, current conceptualization uh, can be uh, really, really strengthened. So let me first uh, begin uh, by defining this uh, key concept, cosmopolitan agency. So uh, in this presentation, I define this cosmopolitan agency as a reflexive expression of openness, uh, inclusion, and morality beyond cultural and personal difference uh, towards a better future. In my prior work on intercultural friendship or relationship development, I mainly focused on uh, how uh, students, uh, regardless of their personal and uh, cultural uh, differences, uh, exercise you know, their agency to initiate and establish uh, their relationship. But in this presentation, I took an idea uh, from Let's Be 2020, uh, Cosmopolitan as a Utopia, uh, which is, according to uh, the researcher, is a reflexive method for imagining a better way of being and living together. So uh, in my current uh, cosmo uh, the definition of cosmopolitan agency, I have two particular uh, characteristics. So one, I take it as an emergent uh, practice or performance in ever-changing social relationships and spatial temporal uh, context. So what I mean is that uh, the uh, cosmopolitan agency uh, is not uh, something um, that individuals uh, um, uh, hold. Uh, I mean, so rather, uh, my idea of cosmopolitan agency, it's, uh, you know, rather than uh, focusing on what kind of, you know, individuals are cosmopolitan, uh, my idea of cosmopolitan agency is uh, what kind of interactions make uh, cosmopolitan. And also, uh, it's always, uh, ongoing and, and because the, and also uh, quite uh, bounded by space and time. And another characteristic uh, of my uh, conceptualization is the ethical and moral engagement uh, rendered through uh, continuous uh, reflexivity. So um, that, which includes uh, altruism, morality, or collective uh, solidarity towards uh, good uh, for other people as well as uh, for yourself. So I now try to uh, show uh, my uh, conceptual framework and I hope um, I can uh, illustrate uh, more later. 
uh, very clearly. So uh, my uh, conceptual uh, proposal here is that a cosmopolitan agency emerges at a dynamic experiential interface between cosmopolitan capital and affordances in convivial proximity. So uh, the interface, okay, I should show you the laser point. So uh, there are two key aspects. So one is cosmopolitan capital. The other one is affordances, convivial proximity. And the cosmopolitan agency uh, is conceptualized as emerging at the interface between uh, these uh, two constructs. Uh, in other words, um, I can uh, illustrate further by using this uh, extended chart. So uh, first, let me focus on cosmopolitan capital. And um, I took uh, Baudu's uh, uh, cultural capital. And according to him, uh, the cultural capital is embodied, objectified, and institutional resources. But at the same time, I incorporated uh, other work uh, about cosmopolitan capital. and. Um, what I uh, try to highlight now is actually the cosmopolitan capital is something individual cultivate uh, over time. So when it comes to exercising agency, a uh, cosmopolitan capital serves as uh, uh, resources which acquired from past experience. So by focusing on resources, I think uh, we can uh, highlight the issue of power or privilege in a very dynamic way rather than a static way, which I found in some um, prior studies about intercultural student interactions. So the other end is environments. So environments um, affording casual, temporary, friendly interactions between students. So I maybe uh, took idea uh, of conviviality and conviviality uh, it's, uh, of course, well-known concept by Illich, and it's a very uh, creative um, uh, interactions uh, between people. And uh, people um, actually can enjoy uh, casual, uh, fleeting, uh, but uh, friendly interactions. So particularly uh, in some places like, uh, you know, the parks, uh, streets, uh, bus stops, and so on. So in those open spaces, uh, people can uh, meet and interact. Maybe they don't know each other's names, but they, they still interact quite friendly. So we experience such kind of space, I, I think, in our uh, daily life. So uh, what this uh, suggests, particularly I want to focus on uh, another concept, uh, affordances as well, because affordance represents a future projection um, or imagination uh, or what kind of interactions our interaction of possibilities are there. Say, if you meet someone in the same dormitory, for instance, if you are a student and you are in a dormitory and you are in the kitchen and you are meeting somebody for the first time, what kind of you know, activities are afforded by the environment? So that's, so this, by focusing on affordances and convivial uh, proximity, we can actually consider many interactional possibilities. And the literature tends to uh, report either the lack of interaction or difficulties of interaction or uh, making good friendship. There must be a third option you know, between uh, peer, uh, mere presence and uh, very consolidated relationships. So uh, going back to the original, uh, my proposal, um, I locate cosmopolitan agency because uh, at uh, present reflexive practice. So every instance we exercise, we have a chance to exercise or display agency. So students reflexively mobilize and transform cosmopolitan capital by means of rather than simply in convivial proximity. So students reflect uh, based on their, those uh, past experience utilizing cosmopolitan capital and physically they are in a space or environments and they um, project the possibilities for action. What kind of action? So uh, people um, at every uh, instance um, reflexively utilize their past resources in certain environments. And especially when the environment is convivial, I think 
uh, cost and avoidance agencies tends to appear. So this is uh, the main uh, proposal. So let me now uh, highlight uh, these four states of cost and avoidance agency. So I want to elaborate on my conceptual framework by um, you know, uh, they're using four uh, states, uh, I mean, four different uh, kinds of um, cosmopolitan agency. And you see uh, on the right side, there are uh, bold italics, amicable and critical. So they represent the emergence of cosmopolitan agency. And the left side, inactive and latent, they are uh, non emergence uh, of cosmopolitan agency. And it seems like uh, critical can be the highest state. And then inactive could read as a lower state or lowest state. But uh, the four states do not emerge in temporary reality and then can emerge at any moment and even simultaneously. So the same person uh, can have uh, amicable and critical agency, you know, the states of agency at the same time. But in other occasions, uh, he or she may not exhibit uh, cosmopolitan agency. So the display of cosmopolitan agency uh, is very dynamic and context bounded. So uh, in following slides, I'm going to show you some examples um, using uh, my uh, interview data, which I collected in two Japanese uh, universities with uh, contrasted degrees of internationalization, uh, such as vision, curriculum, international student environments, uh, enrollment, and language of uh, instruction. And I collected uh, data um, from semi-structured uh, interview from 21 and 22 domestic and uh, international uh, undergraduates at those two universities. First, uh, I'd like to start with uh, amicable uh, cosmopolitan uh, agency. Um, this agency uh, is characterized by the display of friendliness, uh, acceptance, and interest towards potential or uh, present uh, relational partners beyond personal and cultural differences. Um, so this agency, uh, I, I view this agency as a characteristics of purposeful, natural, or selective engagement in meaningful uh, intercultural relationships, uh, such as friendship uh, 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 and romantic relationships. And my main focus uh, on this on this slide is this: um, three different kinds of uh, cosmopolitan capital. I will not say uh, these are only, you know, uh, only, there are only three um, different kinds, but there could be others. But at this point, I just uh, hi like to highlight three uh, different kinds of cosmopolitan capital, starting with Takeshi, uh, who have already studied abroad uh, for exchange students and also who had a, a teaching certificate, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a certificate to teach uh, Japanese. So he's a, a domestic student. So he said, I have a qualification for teaching Japanese and I offer to tutor an international student in Japanese. When I have some questions about English, I can easily ask her in return. So having already acquired, accumulated his cosmopolitan capital, uh, he was able to utilize his uh, encounters uh, with international students focusing on personal um, inter uh, um, focus. So he showed uh, amicable, what I term uh, amicable cosmopolitan agency. So similarly, uh, Patricia, uh, uh, this person is actually half uh, Filipino and half Japanese. And so uh, she's a domestic student, but she had extensive experience living in both the Philippines and Japan. She said, in some ways I have the feeling that I want to be with international students because I feel like I'm one of them. So uh, having an immigrant background, I turned, I used the word, the word uh, diasporic because she's has, she has a you know, immigrant background and she utilized that background uh, when she uh, meet those people. So one thing I should note um, about Takeshi and Patricia is they, they're both very fluent English speakers. And although Japan is not an English, uh, I mean, speaking country, I mean, um, 
So English is not a very common uh, language in our daily interactions. And these two students um, really, really enjoy uh, mixing with international students, largely using English instead of uh, Japanese. And the third, um, this is uh, international students. And, and having uh, already lived in Japan for three years, uh, she has already developed, she had already developed a very fluent uh, Japanese, the local language skills, as well as uh, learning uh, English. So she said, it's true that different countries have different cultures, but we both care about each other. It's a very warm feeling. So uh, if those students, I mean, if uh, students already have those, these kinds of uh, cosmopolitan capital, uh, my main uh, point here is these students are more at the advantage than other students who do not have uh, such uh, cosmopolitan capital. Let me move on to uh, critical uh, cosmopolitan <coughs> agency. So cosmopolitan agency is a sort of extension of amicable uh, cosmopolitan agency. But one uh, big difference is that uh, while amicable cosmopolitan agency uh, with, uh, um, merely uh, shows self-interested uh, social emotional bonds, uh, critical agency involves an expression of uh, cosmopolitan visions and with uh, altruistic and uh, collective uh, solidarity. So this example, first example uh, by domestic student Yugo, and she also had a um, um, former, uh, I mean, uh, international experience uh, by studying abroad. And after returning to Japan, uh, she uh, tried to help uh, international students as much as she can uh, using her multilingual skills, and which of course acquired before studying abroad. So, uh, I think the next person, I think Ayako is more, that quote is a bit long, but uh, it's quite uh, striking. Uh, so Ayako also had an experience of living abroad and also enjoying her campus life um, in two and a half years at the time of interview. And at the time, uh, around the time of the interview, actually there was a big earthquake uh, in Nepal. So this interview was conducted after the um, earthquake. And she said that the day after the big earthquake hit Nepal, Nepali students got together. Uh, my friends and I went to hear uh, what we Japanese could do. At that time, we heard about what they wanted Japanese, about uh, what they wanted Japanese people to do. So we gathered Japanese people and did various things such as fundraising and making t-shirts. Nepal may be very far away from here, but my friend is from that country. So I helped her because she was in trouble. So, um, these two students, uh, Yuko and Ayako, showed uh, what I felt, uh, what I termed a uh, visionary um, uh, interactions uh, using uh, their uh, elite and uh, enriched. And there are also other examples, but because of time, I will not uh, show further. And the third, um, so from here, uh, I'm going to show you the non emergence uh, of latent. Uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, non-emergence of cosmopolitan agency. So let me begin with uh, one person uh, named Chen, international student. Um, he had already lived in Japan for quite a number of years and, and speaks very good Japanese. Uh, but he said there's a little distance between him and me. I mean, him means uh, the Japanese student he encounters on campus. He does not show me what he really thinks he is. So uh, he seems to have uh, lots of lots of uh, accumulated uh, cosmopolitan capital, but his interaction with uh, his Japanese peer is largely transactional. So his cosmopolitan agency uh, does not uh, appear. And the next person, uh, Hikari, uh, this person is also interesting uh, because um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, she uh, studied abroad. And this is the case that uh, she actually interacts with lots of lots of international students, but she chose or she chose uh, not to uh, make interactions uh, into deep relationship. Uh, why? Uh, because um, she already had uh, broad networks of international uh, students. So she can't uh, just uh, increase the number of uh, you know, international friends. She already had uh, formed uh, close uh, international uh, friends. 
uh, networks. Uh, so although she's a domestic student, uh, she cultivated very high English competence, and but uh, she chose uh, not to engage um, in uh, further uh, in uh, intercultural interaction. So finally, um, uh, let me talk about uh, Koji. Um, he is, uh, or he was, uh, showing uh, what I, uh, what, uh, there's actually uh, uh, the term banal uh, cosmopolitanism uh, in the literature, but I took uh, this word uh, uh, from the literature and, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And so uh, the banal cosmopolitan capital, which I put uh, in this chart uh, means that uh, largely this uh, kind of uh, capital is developed from a uh, merely uh, consumption of cultural products and media representations of foreign others rather than uh, direct intercultural interactions. So he said uh, that when I entered the university, I wanted to have uh, white Caucasian uh, friends. I wanted to make friends with him. So I communicate with them in a one-sided way, which they may not have liked. So he had a sort of superficial understanding uh, of the other and cultural differences so he approached uh, it's quite aggressively. But as time, uh, time went on, uh, he uh, developed a state uh, of uh, en uh, enriched uh, cosmopolitan uh, capital. So he said, um, I live together, take classes together, do uh, group work together with international students. I no longer have the feeling that I'm surrounded by foreigners. I have the feeling that I'm just a human being. I don't feel like uh, there's a barrier of nationality. I no longer feel like making international friends on purpose or anything like that. So uh, what this uh, quote uh, suggests is that the cosmopolitan agency, as I mentioned, uh, is very dynamic. Um, and also even some uh, capital uh, can be some aspects or some dimension or some components of cosmopolitan capital can be learnable. So he learned, uh, it's, uh, he developed his uh, cosmopolitan capital. And so that he could um, finally uh, distribute, distribute, I mean, uh, display uh, amicable, what I term amicable uh, cosmopolitan agency. So, um, so far I have talked about actually uh, this uh, conceptual framework and the four uh, different states. Um, by using uh, interview quotes. Um, but uh, against the back background of the literature, uh, I want to stress, uh, I'm going to make three arguments. So the first argument is the dynamic perspective of power and privilege in intercultural uh, student uh, interactions. So um, the power relationships uh, between domestic and international students are widely covered in the literature, but uh, I, I rather feel that they are uh, portrayed as uh, quite static. And uh, but this uh, conceptual uh, framework, I hope, uh, can uh, shed um, new light uh, on uh, the dynamic and intricate uh, relationship between students from the perspective of power and privilege. And of course, um, especially students who have developed elite diasporic in which cosmopolitan, um, cosmopolitan capital uh, were far more uh, advantaged than those with banal or perhaps no cosmopolitan capital. And the second major argument I want to make uh, is the, the presence of third option between passive presence and fully fledged uh, intercultural friendship. Um, something like critical, I mean, uh, the action of donation or philanthropic um, activities, um, they uh, are not necessarily to present uh, fully fledged uh, friendships. Uh, and neither uh, it is a, just a passive presence. So there should be a third option and this third option uh, can be uh, perhaps uh, closely associated uh, with uh, convivial encounters or conviviality. So I want to uh, stress the perhaps the importance of this uh, convivial notion, uh, the notion of conviviality. And thirdly, uh, the role of student reflexivity in the engagement or disengagement into intercultural relationships, uh, interactions. Because uh, some students uh, had a choice, or they actually chose uh, not to interact, particularly at this latent but inactive uh, state. 
So having already established uh, networks or uh, cosmopolitan capitals, and, and particularly other obligations such as finding a job or doing uh, some activities, academic or social activities outside perhaps universities, um, they, they can also serve and very uh, have a big, big impact on the way uh, students use environments. So they don't uh, project uh, future uh, in a quite positive way in terms of relationship development. So they just stop. Uh, showing cosmopolitan agents. So I hope you, I could uh, highlight the major uh, arguments uh, of this over this uh, conceptual framework. So finally, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, some uh, directions for future research. There should be many more, but at this uh, moment, um, this conceptual framework still needs validity because um, it just emerged from uh, my reflection and uh, using the prior literature uh, across different disciplines against uh, my uh, empirical data. So there are six points. And the first point, uh, which I already mentioned, uh, there must be uh, some particular components or elements of cosmopolitan capital that are more easy to learn and than others. And uh, particularly, I just want to highlight the role of English and this can be a quite uh, interesting because even though students are in Japan and many of them take, uh, I mean, international students take courses in Japanese, when it comes to uh, friendships, a lot of especially domestic students uh, reported the role of English. So does it mean that the acquiring and improving the English proficiency would uh, make things uh, easier from the viewpoint of cosmopolitan uh, capital? And secondly, uh, the second direction is to identify concrete conditions for forging the creation of convivial uh, proximity with amicable and regional focus. I'm talking about this. So what kind of uh, conditions are, are necessary uh, for such uh, interactions uh, emerge or, or, or you know, afforded uh, by the environments? So, um, there must be some interesting approach to address this issue. And the third, uh, the importance of uh, reflexivity. Um, because uh, maybe because um, I report uh, my uh, conceptual framework using the interview, of course, the, uh, naturally the, the reflexivity is very important. Uh, but uh, from conceptual viewpoint as well, um, how each individual and also uh, students as a group or as a collective whole um, exhibit uh, reflexivity um, in relation to their display of cosmopolitan agency. So this can be uh, an interesting approach uh, to consider agency from, um, in relation to cosmopolitanism, of course. And fourth, uh, this is very general um, directions because this um, uh, empirical data might empirical data just derived from uh, the Japanese context. So there could be uh, other national, social, cultural, institutional, situational, and like, you know, this online uh, context. So different contexts may offer different uh, affordances and possibilities for interaction. So there might be other versions uh, of these patterns and also different kinds of capitals and different kinds of convivial proximities may exist. So maybe future uh, studies can identify some of them. And also um, this um, conceptualization is still limited to focusing on individual, uh, collective and uh, collective uh, agency. Um, but according to uh, Vandra, there's actually the third approach, proxy uh, agency. So uh, you use uh, other people. I mean, you, you cannot uh, display I mean, on your own, but you can ask or use other people uh, as a proxy uh, for your own agency. So that kind of approach can be quite interesting to look at. And finally, uh, not only focusing on the change uh, or development of students or you know, um, the transformation of students, it will be interesting to focus on students' cosmopolitan agency uh, and its relation to the structural change of the university. So uh, what students as a collective uh, group uh, can do to change. Uh, the, the university, particularly uh, in terms of uh, the internationalization, I think, the, I think that 
can be a quite interesting approach. So um, to end uh, my presentation, um, I just like to uh, introduce one quote from Acha and uh, who said that um, our human powers of reflexivity have causal efficacy towards ourselves, ourselves, our society and relationships uh, between them. So I hope uh, my uh, presentation uh, has uh, helped you to think uh, the role of reflexivity and the self, uh, I mean, effic efficacious uh, nature of uh, cosmopolitan agency in intercultural interactions. So, of course, in a very positive way. Uh, thank you very much. Well, th well thank you. I, I, mean, I think a lot of us are, are influenced by what Margaret Archer has developed you know, around structure and agency, and, and particularly her um, points about the, you know, reflexivity in, in a conversation. And, uh, I think there's a lot of applicability of that, you know, sociological work with its psychological penetration, you know, into education research. She and Margaret Archer herself began as an education sociologist. That's mm. she began with a focus on schooling, actually. Um, now let's go to the uh, very uh, interesting um, call list that's coming through in the chat. And keep an eye on the chat yourself, Hero, because it'll help. In, in, I think, um, you know, clarifying the questions that people are going to uh, use directly in the, uh, on mic. Let's bring in um, uh, first uh, Gertrude. Um, Gertrude Gottam, can you come in, please? Okay, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Cast a hero. Is, it, is that pronouncing properly? Uh, uh, thank you. Hero is okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, just some initial questions, but I probably have some deeper ones in a while. But uh, first of all, why did you choose those two universities in particular? Um, also, do you have any observations on the gender aspects of your findings? Um, and also, what were these students studying? I mean, I was interested to know whether they were, for example, uh, in work placements or were they classroom based only? Were they engaging with the wider society in, in, their, in their studies? And then I suppose the other thing was, um, I was wondering what kind of preparation um, what kind of preparation was in place for domestic students in terms of their engagement with international students? Because I often find that, internet, from my experience, international students might be giving a certain amount of induction or whatever, but domestic students actually are not taking any notice of this and are very unprepared. And I was interested to know um, uh, what your experiences are there. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, so I, I take it as a, a kind of empirical question and uh, why I chose first uh, two uh, universities. Um, they are uh, both Japanese universities, but uh, they exhibit very different uh, contrastive uh, degrees of engagement in international students. So one university had um, roughly a half, you know, international student, uh, I mean, 50% of students uh, at that university was international, whereas the others had only 2%. And also one university had you know, English as an instruction, language of instruction, but others are predominantly Japanese. Okay. And, uh, but one thing common um, between those two universities are they are kind of liberal arts uh, universities. So they're heavily focusing on uh, humanities and social sciences. And of course, mm -hmm. the, both university has uh, international programs. I mean, international minded programs, I should say, like a faculty of international studies or foreign languages and okay. so on. And the students, um, especially in the more proactive university, they have uh, lots of lots of um, engagement, I mean, as universities to local communities. So to facilitate students engagement in local um, civic um, activities, uh, whereas the other universities, because they have only 2% of international students, uh, the possibilities for that kind of engagement is quite limited. And according to their ideas, I mean, and so there are quite uh, contrastive uh, differences uh, between two um, approaches. So, uh, but interestingly, though, although I haven't done any systematic um, uh, coding or you know, analysis across the universities, one thing is quite interesting, uh, though, is uh, because of the samples I took, uh, actually, I focus on positive intercultural interactions. So, I purposely chose those only those students who were ready or who are were willing to share their positive intercultural interactions because I read so many, you know, uh, the literature reporting negative side. 
So my you know, samples were kind of uh, skewed. In, you know, so in the sense that they have very positive experiences. But when I look at their backgrounds, I mean, where they are from, you know, why they chose those three universities, they were actually quite, they were already international, especially domestic students. So that actually led me uh, to the conceptualization of cosmopolitan capital uh, in a broad sense. Yeah, thank you for asking this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks Gertrude. And um, can we now bring in Emily? Emily Goluski, please. Hello, um, I am wondering, you actually kind of touched on this um, in your answer to Gertrude's question, but I'm wondering um, what literature you consulted for determining the degrees of internationalization of the two universities, and then how important did that become in your study? Did you find differences um, between them? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, um, of course, there are, there are many uh, conceptualization of internationalization of universities and higher education. Um, but I can't say particularly uh, what framework or what uh, ideas I took uh, for the selection of two universities, because I, I thought uh, I wanted to uh, explore intercultural interaction issues uh, from student side. So uh, I didn't actually cannot say uh, I use uh, the you know, some scholars uh, particularly uh, work. And uh, so I just, uh, of course, I, I review, you know, broadly the internationalization uh, of curriculum, but um, yeah, for this uh, selection of uh, sites and uh, I just thought so for this, this, uh, this being two sites uh, will uh, enable me to find it uh, something quite insightful. So unfortunately I cannot answer very uh, clearly. Thanks, Emily. Um, now, can we bring in Sayong Lee? sayong has got two questions, I think. Yes, I have, um, if time allows. Thank you uh, for a wonderful presentation. So firstly, I'm wondering if you, uh, if your theoretical framework or conceptualization of cosmopolitan agency is suggesting reflexivity and agency as shaped by this environment and the past experiences, because I'm wondering if you are suggesting this agency is limited or, I mean, this, I mean, this is, I mean, is it not? hello? I think we Yeah, but I, yeah. yeah okay, so. so. Yeah, so if this, sorry, can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so affordances and capital. I was wondering, are they limitations or resources for, for student agency? Because yes, that was my first question. And if I can ask a second question, it's about this power relation that you just mentioned at the end of your presentation. Because I was wondering, you know, some international students, as an Asian student, if I study in my like South Korea and if um, international students, for example, you said one student wanted to um, become friends with this white international student, while some students used this critical cosmopolitan agency when they wanted to help this international student from Nepal who experienced difficulties. So yes, so this power relations and also this conceptualization of agency limited or supported by this affordances and the past experiences. Yeah, thank you. Actually, the affordances, when uh, you discuss, I mean, when we discuss affordances, we also have to think about the constraints and the uh, limitations. Uh, but uh, for this, I just, um, what? <laughs> uh, for this, uh, I want to uh, focus on um, the how, I mean, what uh, environments can afford. And of course, some environments uh, may perhaps invite new behaviors. And, and particularly uh, what was striking uh, across two universities uh, in Birgo Dada is that the place of the door of kitchen in the dormitory. So there are lots and lots of reports by uh, students uh, saying that sharing each other's uh, you know, uh, cuisines and they, how they cook and what they cook and they share food together. So that kind of uh, you know, places or moments are the very typical example, especially uh, for amicable uh, agency to appear. So there could be some you know, limitations. And uh, of course, this limitation may also uh, come from students' own perception because in my understand if my understanding of affordance is correct, affordances are very much about perception. So if students do not perceive the kitchen as a 
potential place for you know, nourishing interactions. They don't act in such a way, even though they have uh, cosmopolitan <laughs> capital, perhaps. So yeah, there, there must be some very uh, more you know, complex dimensions. And uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Yeah, I think we're hearing most of it. Um, it's it's there's this strange sound that comes on, like you know, demented chipmunk, you know, in a in a cartoon. I don't know where it's coming from. Wow. So we are project? Well, I don't know. <laughs> have have um, we go on? Go on. Kira. Okay. Okay. So, but anyway, the second point is the power relations, and of course, uh, the power uh, relations uh, it's uh, quite uh, important and something I should uh, explore uh, further. So. Um, honestly, uh, I don't know uh, at this point, and uh, because you know uh, the pub, yeah, of course, uh, students, uh, if they because because you know cosmopolitan capital, um, some people criticize it as very much uh, pro elite, pro uh, European or uh, Western centric con concept, and some even you know criticize cosmopolitanism itself uh, as. Uh, notion uh, for uh, propagating, you know, uh, Western uh, ideas uh, of uh, democracy or, you know, uh, civilizations. But um, so, but there, there's uh, a whole range of notions of uh, cosmopolitanism, but uh, maybe uh, what I can say is I, yeah, even, you know, uh, if we have a cosmopolitan, I mean, some cosmopolitan agency uh, may, can can be the tool to highlight such uh, the presence of su such you know tacit uh, but uh, sometimes powerful um, condition for students to you know uh, engage or disengage in interaction. So yeah, um, hopefully I can explain further. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm st now still uh, in a very primitive stage uh, to deal with uh, this. But I, I think the cosmopolitan capital is still. Quite useful, although it's quite Western centric. Of course, there are a few people are saying that, of course, there are many cosmopolitanisms, you know. So the Korean and Japanese and uh, non Western worlds has also something equivalent. Yeah. Uh, but uh, still, uh, the, considering the empirical kind of uh, evidence that so many students in a Japanese universities uh, use English uh, for making friendships, so it may have something to say. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for raising this question. Yeah. yeah, and I do think that knowing the work programs that each of you are pursuing, that you, you have good basis for cooperation. Maybe you should, can talk further with each other about your work. I, I think, you know, you're both doing original work, which is of interest to each other. Um, now, let me now bring in Ron Barnett. Uh, Ron's got a couple of questions. Ron. If we're having sound problem, I think you're muted or we're not getting anything from you. Not yet. Uh, uh, we're here. That's where the, the sound's been coming from. It's very distorted uh, and we can't hear a word. So yeah, I think what we best do is don't, don't leave the word um, altogether. Maybe come come back into it, turn off and turn off and then on, and maybe we can work with the chat because you put your questions into the chat. Let's have a look. Um, you've said why the why the term critical in the visionary variant. So that's the first question, Hira. Why critical? Um, so you need to you know explain, justify, define why you're using critical. Uh, and ecology, and you didn't say much about ecology, in, oh. but you used that as a core concept. Um, how is the framework ecological? It's Ron's second mm -hmm. question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, that these two are very fundamental words. And the first, uh, critical, uh, because uh, the uh, the yeah, I don't know how much uh, my quotes uh, were quite useful uh, to address. Uh, but uh, these uh, students, uh, especially those who showed uh, benevolence or compassion, were quite aware uh, of uh, the power difference between domestic, I mean, themselves and the newly coming international students who are uh, stranger to the local. And so uh, there is a kind of a power consciousness. 
And also there's actually a, a other uh, example showing that um, students, uh, because, they because they are not so happy about what universities offer, they actually are trying to change the status quo of what universities is offering by initiating their own kind of cultural or exchange programs uh, on campus. So that addresses uh, the self-critical and uh, quite uh, uh, innovative approach, a creative approach. Uh, so that goes beyond uh, the uh, current uh, status. And in terms of uh, ecology, uh, yes, uh, I use the word um, environment too. Uh, or maybe on purpose, and of course, originally uh, it derives from the Broughton Brenner's ecological system theory. But in this uh, current conceptualization, I didn't uh, use his work. Uh, rather, I uh, use the word uh, ecology because uh, it's uh, the, the environment, of course. And uh, the environment, uh, of course, and uh, com consists of uh, multi layers of course, you know, the different layers are nested uh, with each other. But um, unfortunately, uh, because uh, this may be a uh, concept uh, to a model is uh, too simple, but uh, I'm aware that the role of a bigger uh, influence, um, you know, such as uh, institutional uh, missions and the national social cultural uh, systems and even time. And so, uh, yeah, that's a new scope uh, to uh, expanding uh, to expand uh, this uh, conceptualization. So thank you, yeah. Okay, now at this point, uh, let me ask a question for Hasmi Yanti. Uh, and I'll let me scroll back through the, through the chat. Okay. Here we are. Hasmi says, uh, great presentation, there you are. Hero, you. compliment. Um, and, and his question is, um, did, did your observations include the student's religion? Ah, uh, no, unfortunately, no. Uh, that's something really we should work on. Yeah, but unfortunately, no. Yeah. But there must be something that really uh, sometimes bonds and sometimes exclude, you know, with each other. So, yeah, it's a very, very important aspect. Yeah, thank you for raising this. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Hasmi. Um, now, Mike, Amika, sorry, Mika Chimura, can you come in, please? Hi, Mika. Ah, there you are. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's not a question, but then as I uh, listened to your uh, wonderful presentation, I had a question that, like, um, um, like in Japan, there's uh, there was G30 program, Grover 30, and certain universities were selected, and they started English-based programs. And like it's been more than ten years already, and I'm just wondering, you know, what was the impact of this initiative to higher education in uh, Japan? Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, thank you for raising this. Uh, it may be a bit uh, off the topic, uh, but uh, I think uh, what is uh, I can say the uh, one thing missing in Japanese higher education is the very the notion of cosmopolitanism. And uh, it, because you know, there's also always a kind of tension uh, between internationalism or globalism as opposed to nationalism. And uh, uh, but I think uh, one thing that hardly people discuss uh, even after ten years of global study or even before that is that uh, the notion uh, of cosmopolitanism, which focus on uh, common you know vision or common um, future or common goals. So rather than how people negotiate difference, of course, negotiating difference is very, very important, but mm -hmm. how people uh, can move towards or forward together. So that kind of uh, message, I think it's uh, still, uh, I think uh, there are, of course, uh, lots, there should be lots of lots of um, concrete activities, but I think uh, that kind of uh, message or discourses are still, I think, missing in many, I think, the Japanese higher education, I, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I work for a uh, national university and I'm a coordinator for actually uh, one of their English based programs. But I, I quite agree. Probably, you know, each university has different uh, sort of ideas uh, about um, international programs. And um, some pro university might have their ideas of cost, uh, cosmopolitan um, mm -hmm. agency, but then some probably don't. Then, even you know if they educate in English and and they are still like the international students are student of like a Japanese university then um, probably you know there should be like more discussion like after ten years of um, 
like G30 program, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, Mika. Um, I might ask you a question at this point here. Um, where does the work go from here? I mean, what's your next research program? Or are you already working on that? Um, <laughs> how will you develop your inquiry? For um, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm planning to do some kind of, uh, you know, uh, empirical work. And, but hopefully I want to touch on the place of time. Uh, so by focusing on reflexivity, Mm. Um, but my problem is that I didn't get uh, the longitudinal data, and so the my did, I mean the whole the data I reported today is a quite retrospect retrospective. In some way it works, but it, in other ways it doesn't at all. So um, yeah, how these mm. uh, students' experiences uh, can be more um, explicitly and um, and more dynamically, you know, I think that, that's a kind of uh, new challenge uh, for me. Yeah, but I, I already have a, you know, actually a few other thoughts, but um, yeah, maybe it's beyond the topic for today. So, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, and, you know, oh. when you're studying reflexivity, it's yeah. like you're studying people's, um, you know, thoughts about their own thoughts. And it's a, it's a deep and intimate discussion you know mm -hmm. to get to grips with reflexivity probably it would help to do it longitudinally you know so you can ask people to reflect on what they said before and that mm -hmm. might help to open up mm -hmm. a sense of change and evolution and mm -hmm. you know in their in their thought but you know you also need a high level of trust mm -hmm. i think and also you know the sort of trust that you get in interviews where people are prepared to think of things they they didn't think of before you know, because you're, they trust the intention of your questions, but they feel sa it's safe to, mm. to respond and to speak openly with you. Now, how do you achieve that kind of trust in, in this sort of inquiry? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you personally do that yeah. as an interviewer? I think many of us are doing interview-based work, so we'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, that's very true. And also, there's always an ethical issue. And uh, so how much yes. uh, we can actually uh, even impact those students' life course and <laughs> if you engage in a very long-term long uh, project. So yeah, that's very true. And also, uh, another thing I should have maybe mentioned is that I'm, I'm also, uh, if possible, uh, want to explore more about collective agency. Uh, going beyond methodological individualism, you know, just focusing on individual and um, worlds. And uh, so how people actually uh, collectively do something together, and especially in a COVID time, and there are lots of lots of uh, big issues and small issues, uh, we have to work together. So I think rather than simply uh, taking information and from each individual, of course, that's also important, but uh, what sort of, uh, collective actions uh, can perhaps uh, teach us uh, towards a brighter future. So, yeah, I'm also interested in that kind of thing, yeah. Well, you know, especially important, given that international students, you know, they form groups or they bring groups with them. I mean, they, 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 they're not just single and individual mm -hmm. and isolated. They're also part of larger conversations and networks and, and they change. And that dimension of collectivity is, yeah, is pretty significant for this side of research. We've had a comment from Gertrude who says that she's worried that, that English is seen as the common language and that still leaves many people outside the common language. Um, we have a world problem, which we've discussed a lot on this program of webinars and we'll return to. One of these days, we're going to end up with bilingual, multilingual webinars. I mean, <clears throat> we'll be running translation, we'll be doing all, you know, interpreting, we'll be doing all of that. We haven't got there yet, but we started to actively discuss how we might do that. So language issues, we do need to break out of the single language cocoon, but at the moment, it's all we have. Um, mm. Now, we've had an interesting comment from Thushari um, Wadakala, and I'd like to bring uh, Thushari in. Is that possible? Um, would you like to come in, Thushari? Are you there? No, sorry, but ah. Oh, hi. Oh, good. There you are. Please, please speak. I mean, you've written a good comment in the chat, but you may want to say it as well. 
Yeah, it's just a comment and then thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Great. So my um, concern, not concern actually, my comment is that yes, the, the, the conceptualization of interculturality within international higher education. So for decades, we are thinking that students who come from different cultures necessarily bring different cultures. Hence, interculturality is important. I'm not sure whether that was the, the underlying meaning within this research as well. So I think now that the, the times have changed uh, quite rapidly, especially within the global uh, world and especially with the introduction of uh, technologies. And there are so many learning sites now, networking. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering what, what, what do we really mean by inter within the, what is the relationship between inter and culture? Each culture is inter actually. They are interacting in one way or another. So we are, I'm, I'm not saying that we are all global citizens or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but we are inter. So what, 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 what is the meaning of interculturality actually when we refer to international students? Are we limiting their experiences? Are we limiting their uh, ways of being, ways or capabilities of being together as human beings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice comment. Uh, because uh, mm -hmm. one time people asked me why I use cosmopolitan instead of, uh, say, uh, intercultural uh, capital. And I uh, said that because uh, cosmopolitan can you know, encompass both personal, um, individual, and uh, social, cultural, economic, uh, religious, and so on. So I think it's more kind of uh, comprehensive rather than uh, and highly debatable, you know, relying on, relying on highly debatable notion of culture. So that's how I. Now, that, that's where I'm now at. But uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can agree. Always, you know, how be, what term can we should start with and yeah, towards the future, what uh, the unit of analysis uh, should be. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So sorry, I think you've opened up a very interesting issue there. And I think maybe we should all talk about it a little bit further. Unfortunately, we've run out of time today, but I think we should return to this if possible in future, because these issues will keep being discussed in this program. Uh, Hira, I want to thank you. I think that everyone really liked the, you know, the presentation. It's so conceptually clear, and your use of evidence is so clear as well. So the architecture of the, of the study you know, comes out really well on the slides. So as a result, you open it up for everyone. And you know that as a result, we had a good discussion in the short time we had together. So thank you very much and come back on the webinar program again in future with more of your work. I think people will want to, you know, be in touch with you too in between your appearances in our webinar program. So thank you. Um, colleagues, uh, next webinar is two days time on Thursday and it's called Higher Education as Student Self-Formation. And I'm presenting it myself uh, and it's an, I guess, a, an, my intention in this webinar will bring is to bring the student as agent more centrally into the educational picture. Uh, and I will support that argument with um, by drawing on a range of educational thought and some also some proposals, some thoughts about it, lines of empirical research. Um, look forward to seeing you in two days time and in subsequent webinars, we've got a program which now stretches out beyond Easter, but we still have opportunities to design webinars for May, June, July in the Northern summer. So, you know, do bring your ideas for webinars forward folks. Meanwhile, um, we look forward to seeing you again, Hero. Thanks very much for your presentation today and thank everyone for joining us. Bye for now. Thank you, Simon and everyone.